Good morning. Good morning. Greet you in Jesus' name. It's good to be here with you this morning. I appreciated that one phrase um, that Jim mentioned here in the uh, Sunday school class time. If when we are willing, he is able. That word willing is a very key word. I want to share this morning on uh, the evil and corrupt nature that we as fallen humanity are born with, which was only magnified uh, as the God's people in the Old Covenant broke that Old Covenant. And why do I want to share about that? So that we can honestly and humbly ask our good, loving, heavenly Father for the daily bread that he has so abundantly provided through Jesus under the new covenant, and so that we may not be found in that day as one of those false prophets, or we might say professing Christians, who have done so well at covering their evil and corrupt sin nature that they actually thought they were in the will of God. So let's pray before we start here. Father, we come before you here As we look into your word and we open our hearts to your word and we want to say, speak, Lord, and um, we want to hear what you are saying to us here this morning. Father, I pray that you would take my feeble words and uh, anoint them, Lord, and anything, Lord, that is of me, I pray that you would cause us to forget those things and that we would hear your voice, Lord. We open our hearts to you this morning and we look to you for bread from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in the beginning there, when after man rebelled against God and sinned by eating of the tree there in the garden of the knowledge of good and evil and was driven out of the garden, we see that the very first two sacrifices that were made, that one was accepted by God and the other one was rejected. And when I think of of uh, Abel there, you know, the Hebrew writer, it mentions that he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Have I obtained that witness of righteousness? <clears throat> when I think of, uh, of Abel and his sacrifice, I like to think of it in, in terms of uh, just my simple way of thinking of it is faith in God's provision. And when I think of Cain, I think of it more in terms of trusting in man's effort to become acceptable before God. And as I ponder uh, what it means to me personally to have faith, uh, here's a thought that comes to my mind. Zero trust in man's effort and ability to be right with God, coupled with 100% active trust in God's provision. You know, before the flood, um, God says this about man. He says that the imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of the heart, of their heart, his heart, man's heart, is only evil continually. And after the flood, when he's telling um, Noah that he's not going to destroy the earth again with another flood, he says that uh, because the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And so we soon come to the Tower of Babel where we see uh, man again, just as rebellious and evil in heart as ever, uh, exalting themselves proudly in their own name, making a name for themselves and their own works, by their own works, planning to build a tower that reaches to heaven. And so God scatters them and, if you will, compels them to obey the commandment of filling the earth and uh, separates them from each other by giving them different languages. And then we see God calling Abraham uh, there in Genesis chapter 12 and calling, calling him away from his father's house to a land that he would show him. And while Abraham was yet childless, God tells him that his seed is going to be like the stars in number. I went outside last night and looked up at the stars and there was a lot of stars up there and it was beautiful to look at. I don't know if anyone else got that chance or not last evening. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, so then God tells him, look, the land that you're in here, you, you will inherit it. Your seed will inherit this land. 
And Abraham asks, how will I know this? And so God makes this covenant with Abraham there. And of course, in those days, when they made a covenant, they would take an animal or animals, cut the animal in half, and then the two parties of the covenant would walk through there, basically saying, if I don't keep my end of the deal of this covenant, this promise, then let my body be like this dead animal, chopped in half. It's, it was pretty strong. And so uh, God tells Abraham, get these animals ready, um, which he does, chops them in half, has to keep the birds away until God shows up. And finally, when God shows up, what happens? Abraham doesn't even get a chance to walk through there. God goes through twice, once in the form of a smoking furnace and then again in the form of a burning lamp. And Abraham gets the message, or at least we imagine he could get the message. Wow, if God went through there for me, what if I break my end as a covenant? Does that mean he's going to die for me? And as we know, well know, God did show up in the form of Jesus and did die for us, didn't he? So he's pointing forward to something there. So Abraham, he believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But how did Abraham's descendants fare, the children of Israel, as they came out of, the, out of Egypt in, into the wilderness? And what did God take them into the wilderness for there? Moses talking to them, to the children of Israel, there in Deuteronomy, it says, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. And why? He says, to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And so he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, never experienced before, never heard of before. Your fathers didn't know so that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so God called them out. And one of the hardest things for us uh, as mankind is to become nothing so God can be everything to us. And so the Lord has them out there in the wilderness to see whether they would depend on him or not. And so we too have been called out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery to sin. And we find ourselves sort of in this wilderness of this world being tested and tried to see what is really in our hearts. Well, how did the children of Israel fare in their testing? And the more important question might be, how are we faring in our testings? You know, the Apostle Paul, when he's talking to the Corinthians there about the children of Israel and how things went for them there in the wilderness, he says, all these things happen to them as examples. And they're written for our admonition. And uh, there at Mount Sinai, when God had given Moses all the words of the covenant to keep, and obey, what was the people's response? They said, uh, they readily said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. But in spite of man's best efforts and intentions to do what's right, what happened? Utter failure, wasn't it? They broke the covenant. And so after 40 years of going around and around in the wilderness till that older, unbelieving, rebellious generation died off, God's testimony of them was, I was grieved with this generation and said they do always err in their heart. There was a heart problem there. Always took them astray. But did the second generation fare any better after they entered the land of promise or the promised land? Just before Moses died, the Lord said to Moses, look, Moses, you're about to rest with your fathers and these people will soon commit adultery with the foreign gods of the land that they're entering and they will abandon me and break my covenant that I've made with them. So let's take a look at, at what Jeremiah the prophet says. Um, the Lord says through Jeremiah and um, this is during, Jeremiah's prophecy is during the day when they were taken into ba Babylonian captivity because of forsaking the covenant and going after what Jeremiah calls uh, a number of times, at least eight times, 
calls the imagination of their evil heart. And does that phrase remind you of something that God had said there about man's heart there in, in the, at the time of the flood? Only evil continually and evil from his youth. And so once again here, it's confirmed that uh, man's heart is still that way. Even after, uh, yeah, through breaking the old covenant, it was obvious. It was even more obvious. It was just highlighted. And so the Lord speaking through Jeremiah in chapter 7. Um, the Lord is speaking through Jeremiah here. And he says, I spoke to your fathers. Um, I spoke not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, and that, that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and, and here's the phrase, in the imagination of their evil heart. And another way of maybe saying that, that we can understand it better, would be stubbornness of their evil heart. And it says, they went backward and not forward. And there it is, just like a mule, stubbornness. Go backward instead of forward. And he says, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have sent unto you even all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. There it is again, stubbornness. And they did worse than their fathers. So the second generation actually takes it a step further and does rebels even worse than the first generation. And so the Lord says to Jeremiah, therefore you will speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You will also call to them, but they will not answer you. You shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receives correction. Truth is perished and has been cut off from their mouth. And if we read Proverbs, we can fairly quickly conclude that to embrace correction and instruction for my life is to embrace the path that leads to life. And refusing to receive correction and instruction puts me on a, on a path that leads to death and destruction. Why do we not really like to receive correction and instruction? You know, it kind of has a connotation that I'm wrong, doesn't it? And I need to be corrected. And we don't like to be wrong, especially if we're trying very hard to do what we think is right, and we're still wrong. And so I um, very much remember a time when my grandpa told me, uh, be my dad's dad, told me, where I was wrong. And he looked at me and I could tell it was really hard for him. And he said, Abner, you have a problem. And he said, you are way too particular. And here I was um, trying to just do my best and do the best I, I, I could, a really good job, but I was too particular. And immediately I wanted to kind of respond in a not so receptive way. That was the feelings in my heart. But I thank God that I was able to keep my mouth and not say anything with that kind of a response. And then after a moment, and I don't remember if it was right then or a day later, I think it might have been right then, I actually said, well, thank you, Grandpa. I, I think you're right. And that was the best thing I could have said. It immediately, it took care of the pain of what he said, and I, it was like I received it. And so I let it sink down, and I, and, and I was able to uh, receive it. If I wouldn't have been able to do that, if it would have felt like I wouldn't have quite received it well. But because I actually actively received it, it was so good. And so it's, it's not a painful thing to me. Um, but I, I think that probably more than I realize, that, was, that decision to respond like that was influenced um, by hearing my dad over and over again you know, speaking about that simple truth there in Proverbs, how that, um, you know, the need to receive correction well, and that fools despise correction and reproof. 
And so uh, I, I'm thankful for that, that word of God that affected me in that, that way. But I would say only about four years ago was when my, my correction hater, if, there's, if that's a proper term, was, was really truly broken in a very real way, in, in, a, in a way that it affected every area of my life. Um, and I've had a number of breakings over the, year, over the years, but, and, I, and I believe I still need many more. Um, but one of the things that was the straw that broke the camel's back about four years ago for me in being willing to receive correction and instruction was... Um, when uh, the children that God had so graciously gave to my wife and I began to be a reflection of their daddy's needs. <clears throat> and I knew I have to have God change me. <clears throat> but now... <clears throat> uh, Well, I might just say this. You know, it had kind of bothered me that over the years that I felt kind of these such rebellious kind of unsubmissive feelings in my heart when someone would give me correction or instruction. And whether it was at my workplace or place of employment or even things like going through airport security, you know, and all of a sudden I'm pulled aside for a pat down and my wife and children have to go on through and, you know, collect the belongings by themselves and I can't even be there to help them. And it just felt like, I mean, what, you know, I mean, I'm okay. You know, why do you have to stop me? And I didn't like that feeling that rose up in my heart. And I knew there's, there's something there that has to be dealt with. And um, I can understand now, I realize now why the Holy Spirit could not have his way in my life. It's because I wanted my way. I wanted to be in charge. And if we never learn to receive correction well, We'll just continue to follow the stubbornness or the imagination of our own evil heart. And just a note to myself, all of us as parents who have children, if we want to, if we train our, to, our children to receive correction well, we set them on a path that leads to life. But it's very difficult to train my children to receive correction well. It's hard enough the way it is. But if I haven't learned it myself yet, it just makes it very, very hard. So I'm thankful for the Lord's work in my heart in that area. And, um, but I need to walk in it every day. It's not a once and done thing. I need to choose that way every day. We cannot trust our own evil heart to take us down a path of life. We must learn to receive correction and direction for our life. And you know, the Holy Spirit, he will never force us to follow in the path of life. But he will guide us into all truth if we yield to his correction and instruction for our life. He is the reprover, and he will reprove us to the core. Deeper than any human could ever reprove us. So Jeremiah says, uh, Jeremiah 17 here um, turning back a few chapters here. The Lord's speaking here through Jeremiah. He says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. You know, man's heart left to itself will not go the right direction, and that's why we need correction. And this is what that man who trusts in the arm of the flesh, man who trusts in man, is going to be like. It says, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Very lonely. What a dried up, unfruitful state of existence when we go our own way. But then we have this beautiful picture that's exactly the opposite. It says, blessed is the man 
who trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots in the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor cease from yielding fruit. You know, our heart is so deceitful. And as Jeremiah says here, desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So the Lord knows our heart better than ourselves even. And so Jeremiah was a true prophet with a true message that was from the Lord and it cut to the heart of the problem with fallen humanity. But the people refused to hear him. And the Lord told him that's what would happen. So he had a lot of opposition. And if I want to go down a path of life, then I do well to listen to people who are willing to love me enough to give me the hard truth that hits me at the core of my being. And Jeremiah was one of those people. And a number of times he did also feel the need to address, the Lord spoke through him to address the false prophets of his day, the many false prophets, who had a very surface kind of false comforting kind of a message. Um, they say about these false prophets, they say unto me that, dis they say unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace, and they say unto everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. And then two other times is, is these exact words. They have healed also the hurt of, my, of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there's no peace. You know, just a little band-aid to cover the ouchie, if you will, a few blow kisses, and then make them feel all better. And then that false comfort, you're going to be all right, nothing bad's going to happen to you. And Jeremiah kept on telling them the exact opposite. No, you will go into captivity. You will go into captivity because of you're walking in the imagination of your evil heart. And they hated him because of it. And so the Lord, through Jeremiah, affirms that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and cannot be remedied with man's effort of a slight healing and a comfort on the outside. Oh, we need the comfort of the comforter, the healing of the healer, the one who, as Isaiah says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity, us going our own way. Us being in charge of our life doing what we want. And as the Hebrew writer says, this man Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, is the mediator of the new covenant. And uh, the Lord speaking through Jeremiah says, I'm going to make that new covenant. Back there in, in chapter 31, we can turn back there. Chapter 31, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make, I'm sorry, I should have given you the verse, verse 31 as well. Chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which, that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. I will forgive their iniquity. They're going their own way, doing their own thing, rebelliously departing from me. And their, act, their uh, sins that came out of, out of their iniquity, I will forgive. I will remember no more. Now, jumping back up a few verses, verse 29 here, it says, in those uh, days those same days, shall, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Everyone will be held personally responsible for giving into sin. As Ezekiel puts it there, uh, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And under the new covenant, the children no longer have an excuse to stay captive and stay stuck in the sins of their parents. Their parents will face the consequences of their own sin. And if the children find themselves giving into the same sins that their parents gave into, which happens more often than not, there is no excuse whatsoever to stay stuck there and blame their parents for their bondage. And why? Because under the new covenant, if I am willing to humbly acknowledge the true condition of my heart, which is stubborn, rebellious, deceitful, desperately wicked and evil to the core, then God will give me a new heart, a soft heart that is teachable and able to receive correction and instruction. And the Holy Spirit can guide that new soft heart into all truth. And if I'm willing to take personal responsibility for the true condition of my sinful heart, and yield that heart, then there is the possibility of entering into a personal relationship with the one who said, further down as it says, I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, from the hundred-year-old, from the ninety-seven-year-old to the youngest. <laughs> They shall all know me, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. They're going their own way, doing their own thing, their own will, and their sinful actions that came out of that, I will remember no more. You know, under the, under the old covenant, that stubborn, the stubborn, rebellious hearts had to constantly be pushed and pushed and pushed to know the Lord. But under the new covenant, when my stubborn, rebellious heart is yielded, it can be led instead of pushed to know the Lord. And indeed, the Apostle Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And only as we yield our rebellious, stubborn hearts to be led by the Holy Spirit can we then enjoy the fruitfulness and the oneness of the love relationship that Jesus talked about and so earnestly prayed for in John 15, 16, and 17 there. It's a very obedient kind of a relationship, a very yielded kind of a relationship, a loving relationship. Does yielding myself and presenting my body as a living sacrifice feel a little scary to us at times? You know, the Holy Spirit simply wants to take us on a journey that removes everything out of our life that's not like Jesus. Is that scary? And he wants to start from the inside and out. That's what the new covenant's all about. And so this brings us to that beautiful sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew there, and we can turn there if you, if you want, um, where Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, shared with his followers when he was here. And it cuts to the, 
to the core of the evil and corrupt sinful nature that we were born with. And he shows us that higher level of righteousness that he says we must have in order to enter the kingdom. He says, in fact, uh, he says, if it does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he says, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. For example, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And we must deal with that in order to attain to that higher level of righteousness. Am I letting the Holy Spirit deal with me at the core of my evil and corrupt heart that I was born with? You know, one of the things that happens... Um, among many others, when I do this, is um, the judgmental attitude toward others that Jesus talks about there in chapter 7 of this sermon. It changes into love and compassion and intercessory prayers where I see others not meeting the grade of the higher level of righteousness that's required to enter the kingdom. And so Jesus there in chapter 7 says, beware, beware of the false prophets, or we might say, beware of those professing Christians who appear to be in the will of God. And you know, these false ones, it seems like um, as we look at down through here, um, about the middle of chapter 7 or toward the end here, um, 15 and on down here, it seems like their rebellious, evil, and corrupt nature is untouched by the Spirit's correction and instruction. But rather, it's able to be covered up so well that they even deceive themselves into thinking that they're doing God's will by prophesying in Jesus' name, casting out devils, and many other wonderful works. And in that day, Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work your iniquity, that you that work iniquity, or we might say, you that are doing your own will. In all those wonderful works, functioning in their own power and will and in their own might, instead of yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit to change them from the inside out so that they might overcome that nature, the nature of that rebellious, self-exalting, wicked one that we were born with and then be motivated overcome that nature and then be motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit which always takes us along a path of the humility and the love of Jesus and these false ones never actually embrace the truth of the evil and corrupt nature they were born with as the Apostle Paul uh, says to the Thessalonians they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved And then if we take a glance over there in the book of Revelation, we see the true prophets and then the false prophet and what they're like. We see that second beast there in chapter 13 of Revelation rising up out of the earth and he has the horns of a lamb, or if you will, appears to have the authority and the power of a follower of the lamb. But what we actually see coming out of him is that of a dragon. When he opens his mouth, it's dragon that comes out. The dragon, the devil. And he actually functions in and exercises all the power and authority of the first beast, which exalts himself always by his own power and his own might. But oh, then we see the true prophets there in chapter 11 who do not exalt themselves. In fact, so much so that they're willing to die in order to let God exalt them. And those correlating scriptures there in Zechariah chapter 4, I believe, show us that that's done not by might, not by man's might, nor by man's power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts to Zechariah when he was building the temple there. Or Zerubbabel was. And so, what might be an appropriate response for us here? 
How can we receive the cure to deal with the truth that God had spoken at the time of the flood about man's heart being evil from his youth? How can we keep from making that same mistake that the children of Israel did in walking in unbelief in the time of their testing in the wilderness instead of trusting in God's provision in the face of obvious needs? How can we, who are of the second generation, keep from making the same mistake that they did after they entered the promised land and rebelled even worse than their fathers? And as the Lord's word was to them through the prophet Jeremiah, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and makes flesh his strength. How can we get out of that dry, lifeless, unfruitful, desert-like state of existence of the cursed man? You know, there's many, many different practical ways that we could fall under this curse of trusting in man. And we don't have time to list them all. Um, I might just mention a few, and I, and I want to say this very carefully. Um, but might we sometimes find ourselves trusting in our own knowledge of who Jesus is and not actually know him personally? Might we sometimes find ourselves trusting in the church to give us what only God can give us? Or maybe trusting in the elders to give us what only God can give us? Our response when disappointed by those we're looking to to give us what only God can give us is a good indication of where our trust is. But oh, the heart, Jeremiah says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord does. You see, we don't even know our own hearts very well, do we? But if we're willing to allow the Lord to show us, he's very, very happy to do that. But it's going to hit us to the core of who we are. And oh, the Lord says through Jeremiah the prophet, Blessed, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And what is such a man or woman like? Fruitful, a very fruitful picture there. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. And didn't Jesus say about the false ones? You shall know them by, your, by their fruit. And so the Lord, through Jeremiah, points forward to the new covenant as the answer in dealing with our rebellious, evil, and corrupted heart that we were born with. And Jesus, as the mediator, gives us, the mediator of that new covenant, gives us the the heart response and posture that's needed to tap into that abundant provision that is so freely available to all those who are willing to pay the price. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we might say, Blessed are those who realize and acknowledge that they are totally needy. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And again, we might say, blessed are those who mourn over their own need, for they shall be comforted by the comforter. The comforter will point out our need, but then he will comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we might say, blessed are those who are not satisfied with living right on the surface, but are hungry and thirsty for righteousness deep within. You know, we might well imagine that the crowd of people that were listening to Jesus' message that day might have been wondering as they listened, how will we ever be able to 
reach this higher level of righteousness that he's saying we must have to enter the kingdom. And of course, Jesus already knows that they're not going to be able to meet it. And so he says there in chapter 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man, he says. He gives this little example for them to, to uh, consider. What man of, is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask? And so we need to become just like a little child in order to enter the kingdom. Acknowledge our need by asking, seeking, and knocking until we receive. And as we ask and keep on asking, that expresses faith and trust in God's provision instead of our own. And that fresh provision of bread is available for us every day as we daily yield our stubborn, evil nature to the death of the cross so that we may live in the overcoming resurrection power of Christ and thus meet the higher standard of righteousness that is required to enter the kingdom. God bless you very much. I love you.